Michael's transformation in this movie is the core of it. And his, his going from, you know, being, he's, he's like, oh, that's my family. That's not me at the beginning. And then we watch him become that. This idea that a normal, quote unquote, normal guy could become this sort of like fall into this ultimate evil through the right set of circumstances. The question that always lingers in my mind when it comes to these stories is, is that a, is that a warning Hmm. or is it a fantasy? Hello and welcome to Cinema of Meaning, the podcast from myself, Thomas Flight, and my fellow video essayist here, Tom Vanderlinden from the channel Like Stories of Old, where we seek to explore the depths of what cinema has to offer. This episode is the beginning of a new series where we will be exploring gangster cinema throughout the uh, decades, not from the beginning of film necessarily, because there's yeah. <laughs> we, we, this would be like a you know 10 episode series. Um, we're kind of starting with the godfather of modern uh, gangster cinema, I think, which is The Godfather. And then we're going to work forward from there. Um, so this first episode, we're talking about Francis Ford Coppola's maybe the most famous gangster film of all time, The Godfather. It's kind of the starting point, And then we'll work forward. The next episode is Scarface. And, yep. uh, and then we'll go all the way up to the present, choosing a film from each decade. If you want to participate in this discussion, kind of as we're doing it, maybe help us choose the films or just see what all the films are ahead of time, uh, you can go ahead and join us in our Discord, uh, which, is, which you can find the link in the description to through our Patreon. So check that out and join in the discussion. But for this episode, we will be discussing... The Godfather, yeah, and hopefully laying the groundwork, some some context, some framing, not just for this film, but for this like broader discussion that we want to have about kind of gangster cinema, why it's so enduring, why it's been such a feature of cinema, like why people love it so much, maybe what it says about you know society, us, you know that these films are so um you know have have been such a feature and then also like how these kinds of movies have evolved and how what they're saying has evolved i think th those are all are some of the things that that we'll be interested in examining as we go through this um but yeah what uh, tom maybe you want to talk a, a little bit about your relationship to gangster movies and why you think this is an interesting kind of topic to examine and then we'll start getting into the godfather yeah, the gangster genre, I think, is definitely one of the most interesting ones. As you said, it's one of the most enduring ones, whereas you you have like Westerns, they've also evolved over the years. But they, uh, for me, I think the gangster movie has been, yeah, th there's just something special about it that that's felt like it has been more unchanged and it hasn't gone like with the whims of time, you know, growing more or less popular. I feel like every generation or as we sh uh, shall see like every decade has its own gangster stories and um yeah we're gonna pick one from each decade um to centralize but i think it's also going to be fun to include some of the smaller ones um sort of on the side and uh discuss those as well um but yeah for me i don't know i think it's always been that there's a very interesting escapist fantasy almost that lies at the heart of the gangster story i think um there's a lot of more general themes that i think make this genre interesting you know the idea of being this self-made man this rise to from rags to riches almost from nothing to like a place of power um the the uh, element of wealth, of course, which is often a uh, strong part of these stories. But also, yeah, just the idea that you kind of create your own little universe, I think, is something that comes back um, throughout the years where there's someone who wants to start something for themselves. They gather like the crew, they eliminate like the enemies, and it's just, it's, it's a very... 
I don't know, it feels like this this microscope or, or like this microcosmic story for um, just wanting to achieve something in life and just building something of your own and the, uh, you know, that's also the, the factor of lawlessness, of crime, violence, um, which has its place. I guess you can look at that from a more... If you if you see the, these movies more as the sort of um, like power fantasies almost, there's you know there's a that's a lens through which you can view the the violence and the glorification of violence specifically. I think it's also simply been an element of fun that just made these movies entertaining throughout the years. That made them exciting, um, made them suspenseful, um, subversive because you know. The kind of violence that happens in gangster movies is also often comes as this kind of uh, as a narrative twist a lot of the times where there's some kind of betrayal or a double crossing or a triple crossing or whatever, um, which just makes these movies very um, captivating. And that's something yeah. that I think is also often overlooked when uh, when you, when you want to analyze these things to death and you kind of overlook the fact that it's. You know, it might just be that it's something is just fun or exciting that draws right, right. audiences to to stories yeah. like these. How how about you? What, what what do you think about gangster stories in general? What attracted you to doing this whole series about them? Uh, what are you hoping to find along the way? Maybe I'm also interested in everything you just described. I think there's a the way it relates to sort of like masculinity in a certain way and certain mm. like masculine fantasies of like power or violence um uh, you know and that being something that has been explored extensively in you know the movies that have been kind of held up as like some of the greats i mean i think i think the fact that we're talking about the godfather today and the fact that this has often been regarded as like the greatest movie of all time or one of the greatest movies of all time. I think the impact that this has had on cinema. So, you know, the gangster movie, its original context was kind of like at when movies were really surging into the sort of popular uh, culture, it was at a time where like gangs were like in America, the prohibition was happening in like the twenties, you know, and gangs were suddenly came to this prominence so there was this very like relevant to the time interest and intrigue in the in gangs and what was happening with them because it was just like it was an it was something that was in the news people wanted to know about it and then these movies were op offering this like glimpse into this seedy dark world that you know you couldn't you couldn't so, so there was this like allure to it hmm. um so it has this you know, influence, you have really influential gangster movies kind of at the beginning of cinema's history. And then it sort of like goes dark during the Hayes Code period where they weren't allowed to make movies where, you know, the criminals didn't get their comeuppance at, at the end. And so I think like there were movies about gangs during that time, but uh, they had a not in the way we now see where sort of like the gangsters are centered as like yeah. the protagonists um and then uh when the haze code drops you kind of get new hollywood and you come back with uh you know some of the great american filmmakers like francis ford coppola and martin scorsese and you have them making these movies about you know mobsters that taps into this old tradition in filmmaking that goes right back to the beginning of american cinema kind of brings it back in a new way while you know sort of like forwarding the the form of filmmaking in an interesting way i think like you know the other thing i was thinking about watching the godfather this time you said like you know we could analyze like why is this movie why is the gangster movie so prominent and it's like maybe because it's just entertaining also like maybe because this is just a really well made movie and like if yeah, yeah. if instead of the godfather it had been like a sports movie but it was just like made like crafted as well as this movie is crafted maybe like sports movies would be like the the big you know thing uh i don't spoiler alert for this whole series and discussion i think there's yeah. probably more to it than that yeah but i think that's an element of like 
you know, this being one of this like turning point for kind of the craft of filmmaking in a certain way, um, you know, and the fact that it just happened to be a mobster movie, I think ends up having this, this like ripple effect. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors here and I'm just interested in the way it evolves because I think it's something that still to this day, it's like, I see, I see elements of like this movie, the Godfather and the gangster movie in things like breaking bad and even succession and like all these stories that we're still fascinated with about like people doing like playing power games and you know the family dynamic and like the people who are operating outside the rules in a certain way like we're endlessly Mm -hmm. fascinated with that um so yeah i think there's just a lot here to to look at and think about and talk about what also fascinates me about the godfather especially looking back on it now is that it uh we now tend to see it as this very classical film that has a very traditional style you know the classical style of hollywood filmmaking whereas at the time it was actually kind of or quite like subversive and new and part of this new wave that completely like subverted everything that had come before that developed this whole new cinematic language almost which we now almost take for granted as something that was just a like a cornerstone of this of cinema in general but uh, yeah, it's just interesting how much of a revolutionary new take this was almost on cinema. That's it, it's it's hard to understand or comprehend now. Almost, you know, this is obviously a um, kind of Titanic movie, not mm-hmm. just in sort of its own scope, but also in like the ways in which you could talk about it. Uh, I think I get a little nervous anytime we talk about a movie like this because it's like, what could I say about The Godfather yeah. that, you know, hasn't already been said? Um, but I think it's it's worth discussing in this context of, you know, tr- setting up this foundation for um, for discussing this this type of cinema as a whole. Yep. So what I'm really interested in here to start with, what's the appeal or how, what, how is, what is this communicating to audiences about the mob or about, uh, the gangster as yep. sort of like, you know, why is, why is this movie sort of thrusting that character? What do you, what, what is your feeling on that? One of the things that surprised me when I rewatched that I actually watched all three Godfather movies the last week uh, after doing like three and a half hours of Nolan nice. analysis, I <laughs> was kind of ready for the break. So yeah, <laughs> it was a perfect moment to dive back into this franchise, which I haven't seen that often. I don't know about you, like how familiar you were with these movies prior to rewatching it for this episode or. I think this was like the fourth or fifth time I've seen mm. The Godfather, so I'm fairly familiar with this uh, particular. Yeah. I I haven't watched the others in the series as much, but pretty familiar yeah, with for this me, particular movie. This was the third time I think I saw it, which okay. I watched it the first time when I was really young. I was getting first yeah. getting interested into cinema. You figured like, oh, you're gonna right. open up that IMDb top 250, yeah. and then The Godfather is like the obvious choice to begin with. And <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah. <laughs> So I watched like what was probably my first movie from the 70s, didn't like it, uh, thought it was boring. And then yeah. 100 movies or like uh, maybe 500 movies later, I came back to it older and wiser and ready to yes. appreciate it. <laughs> and that's when I really saw like what, every th- what everyone else saw in it and just a yeah. very well told story that just still holds up uh, to this day. That's just brilliant on all accounts. And then... Uh, yeah I think and that's kind of that was a couple of years ago and then I watched it last week Um, and the thing I noticed which kind of struck me is just how unconventional it is in terms of pacing and writing like there's a couple of times that I uh, kind of checked the runtime a little bit because I wanted to see like how the sequences were positioned and there's like a lot of very odd choices there that you wouldn't see in a movie nowadays like for example, like the intro, the, the the beginning with the wedding, 
like that takes super long that's like 20 yeah. 30 minutes and it's like you're almost like half an hour into the movie before there's any like plot to latch on to or like any that you know there's a lot happening a lot of things being introduced but there's no real sense of okay what is this story going to be until like 20 30 minutes into the movie and yeah. then again with the choice to not have michael be really involved in the story until like 45 minutes into the movie he's kind of just this he's the main character of the movie like he his character arc and his transformation is arguably like the main thing that this movie is about and the subsequent movies and he kind of floats in the background for a good part of that first first hour almost like the first 45 minutes i think um and that's and it's only until then that he actually gets something to do that changes the course of his trajectory really and overall there's just also this weird like almost an episodic structure where after michael becomes involved you know he does that whole sequence where he has to plot these murders on these uh you know these these high-ranking individuals like the cop or the, the corrupt officer and the uh other bad guy whose name i'm forgetting uh this mobster boss and then that happens and then there's this whole expanded sequence where he kind of uh, moves away to si uh, sicily sicily in english yeah, yeah. yeah um to kind of uh marry this new wife that you don't really get to know and then she dies and then he comes back like that never really happened and then the plot <laughs> right, right. Almost, it almost feels like the plot picks up where it left off like he's back yeah. with Kay, who we left in the beginning and it's there's so many elements here that on paper should not work and for some reason there's a kind of magic to it that does make the whole thing gel together and that's yeah I, I recognize it as a good movie, but I I didn't really grow like truly fascinated about it until I, I, I saw it again last week where I was like almost yeah. baffled by some of the cinematic decisions that decisions that were made and how unconventional they really were and how we do not or, or how like a lot of people tend to take for granted how unconventional this is and because this is really not a basically told story you know it's not the lion king where there's a clear you know where every <laughs> beat of the story is clearly yeah. laid out and there's this clear like heroic journey that uh is neatly followed you know it's there you know in the structure and you know beneath it all but the, the way it's given form is just so uh unique and i guess maybe subconsciously maybe that's why it's still so beloved because it feels like such a um such a unique and um almost uncopyable what's i'm, I'm not right. sure what the word i'm looking for here but uh authentic uh yeah. piece of cinema that you know cannot be replicated um until for fort coppola does it uh with part two but <laughs> right, right yeah <laughs> but even that movie has the same kind of weirdness almost where you have this movie that's even longer and then this flashback sequences intercut with the main narrative and they don't yeah you know there's thematic and symbolic connections there but they don't really inform each other narratively that much there's no revelation in the past that helps the character in the future or vice versa that so yeah, yeah. these are these are very unique movies that are unique not just because of the status that they have now but also because there's just so much going on in the storytelling here that i uh yeah I've, I've been thinking about it a lot uh, i'm not sure if i have like anything meaningful to add as to why certain things are the way that they are uh, i know that for example for part two the whole flashback part is mostly there because uh it wasn't like a section in the book that wasn't filmed and so the studio wanted to have it in there and so it, it's one of those weird examples where sometimes a studio mandate can still lead right. into like one of the best creative decisions that that a filmmaker could ever make uh i guess he kind of or uh, francis ford coppola he kind of embraced it as this idea that he wanted to tell a father-son story or show the parallels between a father's journey and that of his son and that turned out to work like brilliantly in the end um but yeah, as to going back to your original question, like what does it say about the mob and uh, 
I think this is the movie that most or that shows gangsters and the mob as this most in this most classical sense where it's very much the crimes are hidden literally in these back doors or behind these back doors away from like the wives and the children it's like this secret man's world that leans a lot of like the facade of like family values and respect and honor and uh, appearances you know everyone wears these nice suits and everyone is um, seems like cultivated and they uh, if they are not like that's something that's frowned upon like the like Fredo yeah. or uh, Sonny you know they are each in their own way a little bit more unfit to be like the quote-unquote godfather and Michael is kind right. of the perfect like stoic gentleman slash soldier who is this perfect combination um in terms of like character dispositions to um rise into this position or at least you know he's he's clearly the one who is meant to be in this world uh sonny is like more the hot-headed one impulsive which is not only like a detriment to like strategically or like um in in the more literal sense but it's also in this culture a little bit more uncool to say it right, rather right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the same goes for F Fredo who is more of this party boy womanizer not really serious kind of a man child uh, you know also reasons why that doesn't make him a good businessman or a gangster but also just like culturally that also doesn't fit into that ideal image of like the cool gangster who is more um, traditional I guess and more of this family man uh, or at least he pretends to be. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And that, uh, I think when it comes to showing the mob, that's kind of what I wrote down for this movie, that it's the most, the one that most leans into the facade of it all, the kind of Sicilian, yeah. also, you know, the very strong cultural heritage and the idea that we have this strong um, culture of rituals, traditions, behaviors, and that's, worth valuing above all else and uh, right. the second part does uh, call that out a little bit more like the hypocrisy behind it and uh, the fact that it's all facade where you know these men try to be all or appear to be all gentlemanly and then while secretly being engaged in these uh, all kinds of vices and crimes and whatnot um, not just in the context of the law but also in the in the context of like their own culture that they pretend to live by or their own right. like code of conduct that reaches kind of a poetic climax in this movie at mm. the end where we have you know literally this image of like yeah a baptism into being the like michael's baptism into being the godfather of this child but also the godfather character the don and then this very literal like statement of like he's saying he's speaking these words of like I renounce the acts of Satan while we're seeing like him enacting sort of the acts of Satan. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's very much this, like this image of like this hip hip, as you're saying, a hypocritical adherence to like a tradition or an, uh, this sense of a moral code while also like completely defying what, what would be considered moral but, you know, by most people's standards, um, you know, I think that's that's part of like I the fascination with kind of the gangster in particular in my yeah. mind versus just like your average criminal. It's like, why why are we making movies about gangsters rather than just like, you know, random? I mean, we also make movies about random criminals, but like there's a particular fascination with the gangster. And it's this idea of like someone who has a set of rules that they adhere to but um but like that's not society's rules it's yeah. like and i think that goes back to what you were saying at the beginning about like this kind of self-made this imp this story of like someone who is self-made or like constructs their own reality it's like oh you know like don corleone he's like you know oh i don't mess with the drug business that's a dirty trade but like gambling prostitution like all these other things that's fine murder yeah, yeah. even totally fine 
but like I draw this hard line at drugs for, I guess, you know, some kind of arbitrary reason, but there, mm-hmm. there's like a co- there's like a code that they adhere to. It's just not the code anybody else <laughs> in society is like adhering to or pretending to, to adhere yeah. to. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some, I think like fascination with that, like that and connecting that to this, like utter confidence and self-assuredness in that, mm-hmm. like Michael being the one who's like, I'm going to do these things. He's the one who's like, who says, who says we can't shoot a cop? Like there's no rule that says that. So I'm going to make my own rules and then I'm going to like assert utterly and completely that those are the rules um and i think there's some kind of like you know sort of like perverse attraction to that uh that like (laughs) you know that sort of like confidence to just kind of make your own rule book and then stick to that i wonder to what extent that also relates to the more like quote-unquote problematic aspects of not just this movie but of the the genre in general where a lot of people have said like these are like, more the masculine power fantasies and they're right. maybe even inciting or glorifying violence, not necessarily inciting violence, I think, but at least like glorifying this kind of, not even like a literal lifestyle, but kind of a way of thinking, a kind of attitude that um, that you sort of see in The Godfather where, because, you know, as you were talking about that ending, I kind of wondered like, you can also argue that the ending is not hypocritical in the sense that, you know, because Michael and uh, the gangsters in general so strongly believe in their own code of conduct and in their own rules and don't recognize the rules on the outside. And they even show like, especially in the, the, the later movies, that, uh, you know, there's corruption and sort of mafia type behavior in like the... right. The, the police force too and arguably in, in part three deals more closely with like the Vatican which is also has this kind of mafia style uh, internal politics going on so you can argue that there's no hypocrisy at the end there because it's all just sort of the same at the end like the 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 rules that Michael adheres to are no different than maybe the ones from the church or even uh maybe Michael is even like more truthful because he knows who he is and he doesn't uh, pretend to be like uh, virtuous. Like he knows he's a man who is uh, carrying out these vices and who knows he is engaged in these businesses. And he, you know, he has some rules, like he hides, hides some stuff from his wife. He lies about it to maybe his children or whatever. But um, in that sense, I can, sort of understand the argument for glorification when as an audience member you're kind of brought along with Michael's perspective you can see like everyone else is corrupt and hypocritical too and so at the end of it you're not watching it as someone uh, or you're not watching Michael as someone who is hypocritical but someone who is just right in a wrong world if that makes sense like if Um, that he's not necessarily in contradiction with some kind of morals, but that he is the one who is right in a world that is equally contradictive uh, or contradictive. And uh, yeah, that in that sense, you know, people would see him and the gangsters in general, not necessarily as people who are in the wrong or who are conflicted, but who are just, you know, living their best life to... (laughs) That scene where Michael comes back and he's talking to Kay again after he's been in Sicily Mm -hmm. and he says, oh, I'm just like another senator or, you know, uh, businessman or something, basically. And uh, and Kay's like, you know, isn't that naive? Senators don't uh, have people killed. And he's like, he's like, who sounds naive now? And there's this like (laughs) there's this like. implication there i think with how the film is engaging with these ideas of like oh you know there's some like truth to that i think where Mm -hmm. we can look at we can look at characters like this and be like oh yeah they're horrible bad guys but then like the people who uh 
on a daily basis are responsible for enacting war and like government sanctioned violence get this like eternal pass because they are operating within the society sanctioned yeah, rules yeah. like the rules of society condone them so we're fine we're, we put that in like a separate category and then there's these other guys over here they have a different code and um you know i think like not that there's not a validity to that separation uh but i think there's something about sort of like gangsters having this code of ethics that they adhere to that feels somewhat arbitrary potentially to us as an outsider is Mm -hmm. it does sort of like reveal something to us about maybe the arbitrariness of of some of the code of ethics that we we ourselves buy into where it's yeah. like you know oh to what extent is like the fact that society is like oh this thing is fine we just got done with our our nuclear dread series um you know and that's one area where it's like i think the american lens of like Oh, we tend to overlook this fa the fact that we just dropped this bomb and killed all these civ civilians. We still overlook that, the fact that our government is like bombing civilians, you know, it's like if you thought about that outside of the context of sort of this like, you know, society has sanctioned that these officials in government are allowed to decide, you know, enacting war is is um is like just part of their job. And that's fine. And so we don't condemn them as individuals for it. Yeah. Uh, generally, you know, on average, the society doesn't. Uh, you know, I think it's like there's some relationship between that and kind of what we're seeing here that I think is is interesting. Um, so I don't know if that that kind of touches what, what you were getting yeah, at yeah, or not. Definitely. But. Yeah, I think that also explains why... Um, there's almost like this libertarian ideal to these gangster movies where you kind of lay out how the, you know, man is corrupt and that corruption runs throughout like every layer of society. And so the right or the best course of action, uh, even just right. from a like pragmatic point of view, is to just create your own little private universe that works and then maybe expand it in order to establish it more strongly. Yeah. And that then is sort of the what the gangster story becomes um because there's oftentimes also this element of uh there, there's a certain altruistic element to it where the gangsters are not just shown as people who do violence and exploit but they're also you know part of the facade maybe but they're also engaged in sort of these more like constructive efforts or protective efforts where um you see this in the very opening scene of the yes. Godfather, which is this great conversation that already introduces so much about what this world means and what values are being adhered by, where we have this man who comes in um, to see Vito Corleone, the original, the OG Godfather. And he has this story where his daughter was hanging out with her boyfriend and her boyfriend eventually, like, assaulted her together with someone else and he went to the cops as a good citizen but they or he felt that there wasn't enough justice served and so he turned to uh, Don Corleone to get like proper justice as only he could provide um, to which he responds like at first very you know with some animosity because he feels like you know you, you come to me and ask for murder and that's that's it and he kind of laments him for not coming to him in friendship and with respect because, you know, if that were the case, he would have been, you know, those two guys, they would have been in the ground by now, or, right. so to say. Um, and so that already lays out, you know, there's the world of the police, the world, the outer world that doesn't help. And then there's this alternative world that you can turn to, but that's uh, arguably, or at least so does the, the Godfather does want to argue, like this is a world where, there are certain codes of conduct. There are certain values that you have to adhere by. You have to show that you respect him. You have to show your friendship and your loyalty. And that I think is part of the appeal that there's this, there's this more smaller, like 
micro society that has more explicit values that you can partake in even you know if you're like low on the ladder if you're just like the the rough guy or the the bodyguard of or something like that there's it feels like a more a smaller more explicit version of like being a soldier who serves his nationality or right. someone who just tries to be part of some more bigger collective identity but then have that be a more smaller but again more explicit one that's more tangible i guess in that sense than being part of a greater society that's uh always going to be is going to be a little bit more complicated and doesn't have that direct connection that you might have if you're part of like one mobster family or one gangster family or um which i guess is again is that more libertarian principle where you are where you value more of these small localized or local scale um, uh, societal structures or social systems instead of these bigger ones. And that's, I, I yeah. think, also something interesting what happens in the later movies that whereas Don Corleone or Vito Corleone's story is very much grounded almost in this single neighborhood of New York, like very quickly, like Mike Michael, he expands the empire like beyond like throughout america he has this big house in nevada like away from everyone else uh, in the second movie and then in the third movie he has this giant multi-million like billion dollar company that's doing business all over the world and there's no like the the old neighborhood has been completely abandoned and that i think also is what especially in the third movie takes some of that romanticism out of it because it's now yeah. it does no it no longer feels like there's this contained shared identity almost or this that shared collective um group of values or that uh you know just a value system that you can be a part of and that also kind of takes away that romanticism that is still more a part in the in the first movie where it feels like this um where it's more localized, you know, physically as well as uh, spiritually, I guess, in that sense. Yeah, there's definitely something interesting about the linking of sort of like the existence of the mob mm -hmm. uh, to this, like the sense that, uh, oh, what the gangsters are doing is almost symptomatic of like a failing on the part of like the institutions that should be providing some of the services that they provide of like like in that beginning scene like oh he went to the police for justice the no. courts and the police were corrupt and didn't offer that and so now the mob steps in to like fulfill that role for this person and then i think we kind of see then like oh when you have a an an institution a smaller institution that's not accountable in any way except through violence that can be taken advantage of to some extent. I don't think this movie like digs too deeply into that because it's mostly about Michael's transformation into sort of this role of Godfather, at least in yeah. the first one. And then you have this examination of sort of the inter-gang politics, inter-family politics and the code of ethics. There is potentially an opportunity there. You set that up in the first scene where you go, uh, he's like, okay, I will give you justice, but I'm going to ask you a favor someday and you're going to have to do it. You know, that favor could have been, I feel like this, one of the things that positions this movie like firmly in the era that it's in is like that favor gets called back and it's like, here, patch up my son, Sonny. It's like a, it's like a very personal favor. It's not one that's oh, yeah. exploitative of that character um, I think like watching this from like um, my c contemporary lens, I'm like expecting like, oh, this is the part where he's going to call back that favor and really screw that guy over somehow. And it's going to show how like, oh, if you if you if you go to the mob for something, then like that's going to really come back to bite you because, you know, you shouldn't have you shouldn't have like tangled with this yeah. criminal element to to get the justice that you wanted. And that's not really like exactly what's being conveyed in this film so i think that's something that might be like explored a little bit more in some of the films we get into uh into yep. later 
I don't know if it's true. I don't know if I agree with it, but I, I feel like some of what this movie is getting at is, or the series is getting at is a little bit what you conveyed where it's like, like part of the allure and the appeal and the reason the mob was able to exist in the, the in the way that it did was this sort of like familial localized sensibility. And mm-hmm. as you expand that outward, it loses, it loses some of that power that it had or some of that allure that it had for people uh and just becomes yeah yet another nameless sort of societal you know institution uh that maybe has the same problems as you know the might end up with the same failings as like business or government or you know whatever yeah exactly and that's not to say the mob is <laughs> like <laughs> actually replace replacing those things in some way there's also something uh where the the story of the mob also reflects a little bit of how general institutions work and where they tend to fail or at least fall yes. short which is something that we also sort of talked about in the Oppenheimer review where you see like all these big historical decisions being made by these high political figures and it's not based on like strategy or right um like this this detached objective reasoning but it's very much like pettiness and personal little happenstances that ultimately like shape a lot of um, the workings of these kind of institutions. And, you know, to some extent, I think there's a, there's a reflection there between, um, or at least in that sense, these kind of gangster movies sort of reflect how society in general works, but at the same time, it's it's obviously also a bit of a simplification to say like, or like a, even a little bit cynical, I'd say to say like, oh, you know, who cares about the mobsters? Everyone is corrupt. So that's not what I'm right. arguing for. Here. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not either. Yeah. Um, but I do. But like, there is something to be said for like the corruption of legitimate institutions mm. allows for illegitimate ones to sort of like you know i think like a healthy society should have healthy institutions that sort of like i would argue like we have less mob activity now in in america than we did like in Mm -hmm. the 50s or whatever and it's like part of that is because i think in a lot of ways to a certain degree some of our like as as screwed up as so many parts of america are like a lot of our institutions in some ways are a little bit more functional now than they were then in certain areas. And so yeah. it's like the mob doesn't, can't exactly persist in the same way that it used to because of like, it doesn't have the same way to kind of like get its grip on the people that it needs to, in order mm-hmm. to do that. I think some of the, some of the movies we'll talk about later, will definitely deal with that directly where you see yeah. kind of like the, the transition pretty explicitly where like the this era starts to uh to disintegrate a little bit like the mob how we see it now um is is sort of all you already see it i feel like the godfather is positioned at the beginning of that that downward decline uh we'll only see the mob sort of like lose this kind of uh archetypal sort Mm -hmm. of you know iconic image that it that we see at the beginning of this movie it'll only disintegrate more and more from here and also that facade that they that there's a large part of their um uh functioning is revolves around these protective or constructive efforts to make up for where traditional society fails because that's i i do think that even though the godfather does in some way, like point out some benefits to localism in, in general. I think uh, there's writers like um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb who have argued very much for more localism and sort of against just globalizing everything for the sake of itself. And uh, I think there's merits to that. And you see that like in the environmental movements and such, there's movements towards localism that uh, have shown not just like... Um, certain practical benefits to 
having like little circles in your own physical space that you can rely on or you have these little support lines from you know farm to table or whatever you know those kinds of concepts right um in my city especially like i live near a university that has a lot of agricultural and um green science um programs and you can see uh in the city you know city surrounding it there's a lot of these local initiatives where um people share food or there's like these uh plots of land where stuff is being grown and people share like the uh the yield of it and you know so there are like certain there's definitely certain benefits to having stuff more locally organized and that's kind of somewhat ironically what these gangster movies or at least the godfather i think uh especially in uh, don corleone's era where he was more concerned with just his own neighborhood they kind of show that but at the same time i think what the the way that the godfather also shows why that kind of uh you know why the gangster is n- not a great substitute for general society or traditional society is because uh it shows so well how whenever there's one man one gangster standing up believing he can be the godfather to the neighborhood there's like five others in different families right. who believe yeah. the same thing yeah yeah. And that's just an inevitability of them clashing into each other at some point, um, which leads to the compromising of their entire values. Because that's, I think, the the part where both Fido and Michael kind of uh, genuinely become like hypocritical in the sense that they really contradict their own values and not the values that they didn't care about uh, to begin with, is when... Um, Vito at one point embraces the narcotics industry anyways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because he feels like that's what's necessary to, uh, you know, he argues that it's for the sake of keeping the the family alive and keeping the, the neighborhood in the state that it is, when really it's also very much just about him um, trying to maintain his grip on his own power position. And yeah, uh, Michael does that too, especially in the second movie when, you know, he contradicts his own family values by literally spoiler alert uh, uh assassinating or ordering the assassination of his own brother fredo and in the yeah. first movie too you know he uh ultimately uh, contradicts himself in so many ways you know a little bit by bit kind of chipping away at his old personality to transform into the very thing he at the beginning swore he would never become right that's i think how the godfather also at the end like uh definitely shows the tragedy of its own concept and definitely not uh uh, i don't think it's like ambiguous as to what it argues for in that sense it doesn't romanticize the gangster concept as something that oh maybe this would be better for society i think it ultimately very uh strongly and definitively shows as you know this is not a, a a great path forward this is only going, going to lead to uh like death violence and tragedy yeah i think i think it's only romanticizing things insofar as you know i think something will probably have to come back to uh scorsese deals with this more explicitly i think but like something will definitely come back to throughout this series is like i think part of making a really compelling critique of something is conveying why it is alluring in the first place to the people who fall in prey to that thing. So yeah. it's like you have to you have to depict why the mob was appealing to the people who were involved or why its power persisted in order to like in order to thoroughly critique it, you know, you have to show sort of like what it is about it that allowed it to become what it was um you know because if you're just coming in and going like that's bad and stupid and it should have never been like that then it's like i think you kind of miss the opportunity to learn like oh what what sort of like needs that were not being met in society or in individuals like what sort of needs were there existing there that then this you know, this institution or tradition comes in and exploits Mm 
in order to, you know, like gain for its own, you know, use for its own power. Um, Because I think the way you really like fix that solution then is to go in and be like, okay, well, if people, if the mob is sort of being upheld by this system of, you know, relying on favors in the community, and the reason that it can garner those favors is because it's supplying to people like sort of the quote unquote justice that they aren't able to get from the police. It's like, well, then the solution to that is not to like make the mob illegal because it's already mm-hmm. illegal. So yeah. it's like the solution to that is to fix the, the like the thing that is, you know, creating this kind of power vacuum that then the, the mob is coming into. Yeah. I think there is maybe a little hint of romanticization here, but it's in the, it's, it is, I, this will be the tension that we'll explore throughout this series is, you know, there's a fine line between like depicting that romantic element well and thoroughly enough. And then also creating Mm -hmm. something that, you know, you see people there's, there's this bit in this movie where, part of why Don Corleone um, part of why like they make the compromise on the drugs thing, even though they don't want to get involved in that is because like the economic pressure is too great. Um, And there's, and there's this little bit of a linking of like part of what is sort of corrupting the mafia in a sense, its own value system is like businesses like this loss of this, like, the loss of something to just economic pressure and business. Um, and I've seen people use this, like it's not personal, it's strictly business, like sentiment that is in this movie yeah, as yeah. like the lines that are coming out of basically this like villainous man's mouth as like, you know, a, an unironic justification for like, you know, why they're, they're, doing something yeah. in like why your rent you know, uh, just went up 200 percent. right yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um so it's like you 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 always have this this risk of like people not understanding the critique and sort of just mm-hmm. unironically engaging with the, this something like this but i think that's something that we'll, we'll be able to discuss yeah in more depth as as the series progresses i think that's also it is a very much part of that tension of um, Michael's transformation between, you know, is he very much this self-made man who climbed his way up to, you know, being head of this family, or was he just kind of pushed around by circumstances and by fate to end up in this position where he didn't necessarily want to be, maybe at some point, uh, but not in the way that he... um, that it ended, I think, very much at the end, um, because I think I was also thinking of how uh, Francis Ford Coppola kind of reveals his own um, ideal life almost through this movie, and then also the fear of how what kind of tragedy would separate him from that ideal life. Where he, I feel like he's very much this guy who would, I think, he literally has like this wine. Um, uh, right <laughs> winery in in Sicily Sicily or in Italy somewhere and you know he, he very much feels like this guy who has this big family uh who he loves to involve you know you know he's also kind of known for nepotism and casting his own family members in movies and stuff um but he feels like this big family guy who just wants to live on this farm drink some nice wine have some nice olives and bread and uh focaccia and whatnot um and then the Godfather is essentially like the the essence of what kind of tragedy would have to happen for him in order to not have that life. You know, he's, you know, you can almost see Michael attempting to escape whenever he can. And then he even goes back to Sicily, but then his new wife is killed and he has to go back. And uh, at the end of it, he doesn't return to Sicily until like the very end of the Godfather 3, where he's just now old and sitting by himself uh in this in, you know in the chair in this now uh empty landscape or empty estate that feels more like a ghost uh like a haunted house and uh depending on which god of the third movie you see like he either dies there or he just sits there and that's the end of it um so yeah that, that's also something that i thought was 
very interesting in the way you, when you kind of link it more personally to uh, yeah. who Coppola is and um, what that says about you know where he thinks uh, or, or what this movie is about and what uh, the real tragedy of it all is. Yeah, yeah. There's something that's always so interesting to me. Every time I watch this, I'm kind of surprised by the 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 move to have uh, Don Corleone die the way that he does, where it's just like this very like quiet, intimate scene. He died. He just like you know was playing with his grandson, and then he that's Vito. Yeah, yeah. Or Vito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dies among the you know his tomato plants, and it's like. Mm-hmm this man who is this sort of like everybody's out to kill him. He's been shot in the streets that doesn't kill him. And then he just sort of like topples over one day. And there's like, a there, that part of the movie to me is like one of the more interesting thing, like moves that I don't fully understand, but it, it always, uh, I always find it provocative in a, in, in an interesting way. It's also definitely one of those weirder things that I was talking about in the beginning, like these weird choices yeah. where he gets shot, almost gets killed, but then he's fine and he gets to mentor Michael for a little bit and then right, he collapses right. anyways for no yeah. specific reason. <laughs> right, right. But that's also very interesting in the second movie where you, uh, while you kind of see Michael on the further decline, at least when it comes to his moral um, state of being, you know, um, you, when you see the flashback movies or uh, flashback sequences of Fido, it's very much more of this, it's almost like this heroic story where you can see him going to Italy. It's, it's almost like Lion King-esque where he's uh, he has to flee from his original kingdom because the there's some mobster there who killed his family and then he builds a life for himself in New York and he gets a, a wife and a family and he rises to become like the... The, the godfather type person and then he goes back and he gets his revenge and you know it, it all ends kind of victoriously or triumphantly for him and if you look at his general story you know there's obviously tragedies towards the end where he loses one of his sons which um, obviously weighed very heavy on him but he does get to die you know that that sort of peaceful uh, death in some kind of nice moment instead of being gunned down in the street as a yeah, lot of those yeah. others um, ultimately experience. So yeah, there, there's a nice, there's an interesting contrast there, I think, between how Vito's story plays out and the way Michael's plays out and why why one ends the way that it does and the other the other way and why one feels more like a story on the rise and one feels more like a story that that's faded towards tragedy. Um, I'm not sure if I have an answer to that, but, um, it's just an interesting thing to consider at least. I think, uh, the question that I want to explore here at the end or, or not explore the question, but plant the seed of that maybe we can explore further is like, Mm -hmm. I think you, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but this, this sort of like Michael's transformation in this movie is the core of it and his his going from you know being he's he's like oh that's my family that's not me at the beginning and then we watch him become that like that's the the trajectory of this movie it's a trajectory that you know i think culturally we're really fascinated by that's the fuel of of like shows like breaking bad which is you know you know been one of the most popular yeah. um films it's like this this idea this idea that a normal quote unquote normal guy could become this sort of like fall into this ultimate evil through the right set of circumstances. And I think the the question that always lingers in my mind when it comes to these stories is, is that a, is that a warning Hmm. or is it a fantasy? Like, is it, is it like, oh, within, you better watch out because within everyone lies this potential for mm-hmm. like more evil than you imagine that you're capable of if the right circumstances like played out. You know, there's there's kind of a warning in that. 
But then there's also a little bit of what feels like a fantasy within that, which is like you secretly could be this like, you know, this like cool evil villain uh, if the right yeah. circumstances played out. Uh, and I think that's that's a question that'll probably continue to to exist kind of yeah. throughout some of some more of these films that, that we look at. Yeah, definitely. I think my short answer there would be that there's a sort of there's a natural duality in that kind of internal force that has potential for both constructive things as well as destructive things like right. the idea like the fire that can warm you and that can power machines can also burn you and uh, to, to destroy your house and, and so right. on. And so that's, I think, the the kind of the, the interesting thing about these movies is that they kind of explore the line maybe and where, um, if, if there is a way to sort of manage or encapsulate that kind of power or that potential without falling into those destructive side effects or without it um, coming back to bite you in the ass a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that I think is kind of the crux of it all where it kind of, yes. because there's, there's never, where you, when you say that there's a, if it's a warning or a fancy, obviously it's a little bit of both. I think when you mention Breaking Bad, you know, there's also, there is the story of a man who falls into ultimate evil, but there's also the story of an ordinary man who becomes an emperor of his own empire at least briefly right. and who becomes a man of importance and the man who knocks, you know, the, the, the guy who just makes, makes his life worth living or makes something out of himself. Whereas he could have remained like passive and, uh, have just, who could have just like squandered the kind of potential that could have led him to greatness, but also maybe led him to that, that ultimate vice. And so, yeah, I, I I, I, I guess like gangster movies in that sense, they might be more of a warning that because they ultimately tend to fall into the uh, the tragic side of it all and show like these are the stories of potential gone wrong or at least power gone array or something like that. But um, yeah, we'll definitely have to see how this plays out in uh, uh, the, the decades that come after this because I do think there's a lot of uh, interesting evolutions that go on, uh, or will um, that we'll, we're, we're going to see, especially when it comes to also that um, sort of the facade of the gangsters and the way the, the explicitness of their criminal behaviors, the way they not just you know create this alluring family that people want to be a part of, but the way they also leave victims and people who despise them and essentially are ruined because of their existence so yeah i think it's um going to be a fascinating series uh, i'm already looking yes. forward to revisiting scarface ma mainly because it's also a great transition from seeing al pacino play uh, <laughs> yeah. michael corleone and then having be this yeah. totally different character in in uh, in scarface yeah yeah, all the restraint of, of <laughs> yeah. the Godfather is going to completely shatter as we go into from the 70s to the 80s with Scarface. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a little bit of whiplash, but um, but that'll be fun to discuss. So yeah. thanks so much for listening. We'll see you on the Patreon or in the next episode. <laughs>